What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Riddell and in today's video we cover one of the big three systems of the Dutch defense in the Stonewall Dutch. Now this is one of my favorite openings for black against the move d4 and it has a proven track record at the professional level. I mean Magnus Carlsen himself has beaten Fabiona Caruana and Vichy Anand with this exact system and I'm super pumped to show you all the chess opening theory and the chess strategy behind it. Now we're starting off with the Dutch defense which is really a flank opening not using one of our center pawns but still fighting for the center of the board and in today's video we're going to be covering what to do against the most popular option of g3 looking to fee and shadow this bishop putting it on a very active diagonal but really no matter what white plays i mean if white plays a move like e3 instead and then bishop e2 or bishop d3 our setup's going to stay the same we're going to set up our stonewall dutch and there's really nothing that white can do about it here we're going to play the move knight f6 and against the move bishop g2 we're going to continue with e6 and now against a move like c4 the magnet this Carlson special C6. I really like this move. At first sight, it may seem a little bit strange, but the whole point is that the very next move, we're looking to play D5, guys. And in the stone wall, if you ever see white take your pawn on D5, don't take back with the knight or with the pawn on E6, but take towards the center of the board with your C pawn. Keep this pawn structure solid. Keep knight E4 ideas in the air and really give yourself some space on the queen side of the board to continue developing your pieces. Now against a move like castle and king side, we're now gonna play bishop d6, and let's just take a quick look at this position. As y'all can see, we have put our pawns on light squares from f5 all the way down to b7, and our bishop on d6 is not on a light square, but on a dark square, and is a very active minor piece. On top of that, our knight on f6 can go into e4 at a moment's notice. Now. What are the disadvantages of playing like this? The disadvantages is that even though we've got the light squares, such as e4, for example, we've given up the dark squares, one of them being that square on e5. We got something out of it, but we also gave something up. We got a very active minor piece on d6, but our bishop on c8 is not very active right now. It's very comparable to almost a French defense type bishop, a tall pawn right now, not really doing a whole ton. But as y'all are going to see, if you know what you're doing here, you can actually get this bishop to be a very active piece. However, we're not the only ones that have to figure out what to do with our bishop. White has a big decision to make right now, and that's what to do with their bishop on c1. The most popular option for white is actually just b3, which first off gives a little bit of support to that pawn on c4. And it also opens up ideas such as bishop b2, fianchettoing the bishop, or even a4, followed by bishop a3, trying to trade off with our very strong bishop on d6. That's one option. This is the most popular option. But what happens if white doesn't do this? I mean, why is this played nearly every single time at the grandmaster level? Well, if white puts the bishop on d2 or e3, this bishop's not going to be very strong. It's not going to have a ton of range, not a ton of mobility, and it's just going to make white's position pretty cramped. If we see a move like bishop f4, you're probably not going to see this very often because here we can simply capture the bishop, and here white, yes, got our bishop on d6, but now they have a double pawns on f4 and f2, and the king is a little bit more prone to attack. I really don't think that black has much to worry about here. I mean, we can just castle kingside if a move like e3, continue to develop with a move like knight d7. And yet again, this is a key idea in the stonewall, guys. Knight e4 is always available at a moment's notice if a move like queen c2. Never hurts to play a move like king h8 and really just secure the positioning of this king. And if white ever does take our knight, we're going to play f takes e4. And against a move like knight e5, we can capture that knight right off the board, continue with an option like queen g5. We have a very active queen attacking that pin bishop on g2. We have a very active rook on f8. And we can also play ideas like b6 and bishop a6, trying to take control of this very active diagonal. I would take black here every single time. So guys, that covers the move bishop f4. We're just going to take that bishop off the board, give white double pawns, castle kingside, continue to develop, eventually throw our knight into e4, and we're in business. Now what about the move bishop g5? I don't really think that this is a great option because we can now play h6, and by the way, if white goes back to f4, they just wasted a move for really no reason, and if white does take on f6, we can now take back with the queen. We now have the bishop pair, a very active bishop on d6. We're simply going to castle kingside, continue to develop our pieces, and I really don't think that white has much of an advantage to show here. So guys, that is why usually you're not going to see this bishop take any of these squares along this diagonal, but instead just play the move b3. Now one of the main ideas of b3 is to actually play bishop a3 
looking to trade down with our bishop on d6. So we're going to make this a little bit harder. We can't stop this idea forever, but we can make it a little bit more difficult for white. We're going to play the move queen e7. And notice here, if the move bishop a3 is played, we simply win a piece. One option here for white is to play a4 so that the rook also defends that square. And we're going to cover what to do against a4 at the end of this video. But let's first cover the most popular option of bishop b2. What do we do against this? Well, we're just going to continue to develop our pieces with castle and kingside. And now after the move knight bd2, we need to figure out what we're doing with our bishop on c8, guys. In the Dutch defense, especially the stonewall, do not let your bishop on c8 become passive. Don't play bishop d7, followed by something like rook e8, and allow this bishop to become a tall pawn. That makes our game cramped and makes our game awkward. We need to get all our pieces involved. And in chess, guys, every single move you make, you should always be trying to improve the positioning of your pieces and there's really two different ways that we can do this in this position one of the ways to activate this bishop is by playing b6 and bishop b7 and the other one is playing bishop d7 bishop e8 and bishop h5 kind of a cool little maneuver there getting that bishop to the king side of the board let's first cover my favorite option of b6 now really guys the main idea of this line let's say white plays a move like 95 we're going to play bishop b7 followed by a5 and the very next move, play knight a6. Again, guys, we're playing b6, fianchettoing that bishop, playing a5, expanding on the queen side of the board, followed by knight a6. Four straight moves. We are spending a ton of time on the queen side here, but it is more than worth it. Now, this knight a6 move may seem a little bit strange, but I actually really like this move, and I think that this is where the knight is the most active. Now, usually, we don't want to put a knight on a6 because the knight on the rim is dim. However, look at the other option of knight d7. What is this knight on d7 really doing? I mean, it is attacking the knight on e5, but if we take that knight, white is simply going to be able to play d takes e5, forking both our knight on f6 and our bishop on d6, as that square is so well supported. I mean, I guess it's defending the pawn on b6, but white's not going to be attacking that pawn anytime soon, and it kind of limits the range of our queen as well. So because of this, we're not going to play knight d7, but instead play knight a6, which really does cover some key squares, especially that square on b4. There's a ton of knight b4 ideas in this game, and on top of that, by playing knight a6, we are supporting a potential c5 push. Now, what happens if at any point white does capture our pawn on d5? Yet again, guys, we're not going to take back with our knight. We're not going to take back with our pawn on e6. We're going to take towards the center of the board. And now we're keeping our pawn structure solid. We're keeping some space open on the queen side of the board. And one of our rooks come to c8, which is a very nice potential square. Notice here how it's actually very hard for white to develop here. For example, if the move queen c2, we play knight b4, attacking the queen. If white plays queen d3, we play knight b4, attacking the queen. And if queen to d2, we can simply play knight e4, yet again, attacking the queen. And now if a move like queen e3, we can play rook fc8, very nice file for this rook. And guys, one of our key ideas here is to actually play knight b4, attacking the pawn on a2. And I know many of you are probably wondering, wait a second, I mean, after knight b4, can't white just play the move a3, attacking our knight, forcing it right back? to a6 well guys after knight b4 and a3 we actually have that knight c2 idea i mean just throwing our minor piece into the white camp attacking the opponent's queen and if a move like queen d3 we always have bishop a6 ideas activating this bishop and attacking white's most powerful piece this really does lead to a ton of activity for black and there's not really a way to stop it i mean even the move a3 would usually work but notice how this pawn is only defended by one piece. We're simply going to take the pawn, and all of a sudden, guys, we're up one pawn, and white really has nothing to show for it. So guys, if white does capture the pawn on d5, take back towards the center, put a rook on c8, and have knight b4 ideas in the air. Now what happens if white doesn't capture the pawn and instead plays a move like queen c2? I personally kind of like the move c5, creating some tension right in the center of the board between our d and c pawns. And look guys, if white doesn't capture one of our pawns, we can simply continue with moves like knight e4 is always an idea. Knight b4, we can always put a rook on d8 just for when things break open. And we're just going to continue to develop our pieces. The big question is, what happens once white does take one of our pawns? Let's first cover the better option 
of c takes d5. What do we do against this? Well, we're going to play knight b4, attacking the queen. Notice how we're attacking both the queen and the pawn on a2. So oftentimes you're going to see white play queen b1, trying to hold this position together. And now we're not going to take back with the pawn but instead play bishop takes d5, activating our bishop. This is a very hard position to play with as white, and if white ever does take on c5, we can now take back with our pawn, whole idea being that we're really supporting that knight on b4, and really the next move, I mean, let's say white plays something like rook d1, we can continue to expand on the queen side with a4. Notice how this pawn is supported by a rook, and white can't really take the pawn because of bishop takes a2, forcing that queen to a1. I mean, this is just going to be crushing for black. And if a move like a3, we have bishop e4 attacking the queen. And if a move like knight d2, which is, by the way, the only move white has to defend that pawn, we can simply capture the pawn on b3. And now after a move like a takes b3, we can play knight a2, forcing that rook to c2, the only safe square. And by the way, guys, in this position, if you're playing a higher rated player and you want a draw, you can totally get one. You can play knight b4, forcing that rook back to c1, knight a2, forcing that rook back to c2, and you could just go back and forth, and all of a sudden you have a draw. I personally don't really think that black needs to play for a draw here, though. We can play bishop takes e5, whole idea being after that bishop takes back, we can play knight b4, attacking the rook. After rook cc1, why not go crazy and just play the move knight g4, attacking Attacking that bishop on e5 and from a practical standpoint guys i mean i would take black here every single time white is on the brink of losing this game i mean look at the activity of our pieces our knight on g4 our knight on b4 which is not going anywhere anytime soon our centralized bishop on d5 we have a good queen on a7 that does have some flexibility and range in this position and we even have ideas like rook a2 followed by rook a8 i mean this position is super fun to play with as the black pieces so guys, that covers the move C takes D5, in which case we're going to play knight B4, attacking both the queen and the pawn on A2. We're going to take back with our bishop, continue to expand down the queen side of the board, and we're going to have very good chances to fight for the win. Now what happens if white plays the move d takes c5? In this case, I kind of like taking towards the center of the board. Notice here if white does take on d5, we're going to play knight b4 attacking the queen, followed by bishop takes d5, and that actually transposes into the line that we just covered. Now what happens if white doesn't capture the pawn on d5 and plays a move like rook d1? Well, in this case, guys, I think that black is nearly winning this game. We're going to play knight b4, attacking the queen, and after a move like queen b1, continue with d4. This is a key idea of the Dutch defense. If white does capture on c5, we're going to take back towards the center of the board, and if they don't take on d5, we can push our pawn to d4. I mean, look at this pawn on d4 really making things tough for white in this position. We have very active pieces, especially this knight on b4, which is really making things hard for the white camp, especially for this queen on b1 that can barely even move. White may want to play a move like a3, trying to get rid of the knight, but against this, we can now play bishop e4, attacking the queen. Now, if white plays the move queen a1, this may be one of the saddest queens I've ever seen in my entire life. So I think the better option here is knight d3, but even then, we're simply going to play knight c6 with the idea of the very next move playing e5, and I mean, look at the space and activity right in the center of the board that black has. This bishop on e4 is making things extremely difficult for white. This knight on d3 can't even move. The queen can barely move. I mean, if a move like queen c2, again, we're just going to continue with that e5 option. And here, if white tries to trade down with a move like knight d2, which at first sight seems like a good idea, right? I mean, they're cramped. They're being attacked. Why not trade down? Well, we're now able to take on g2. And then the very next move, play e5 with e4 and e3 ideas in the air. Knight h5 ideas lingering. We're going to attack this king on g2 very aggressively. And black should win this game very quickly. So guys, going back to this position after the move, knight d2, and we're trying to figure out what to do with our bishop on c8, that is one of the options. Playing b6, bishop b7, a5, knight a6, eyeing knight b4 ideas, supporting a c5 push, getting our rooks involved, knight e4 ideas in the air. We have a ton of flexibility and a ton of activity in that game. Now, that's my favorite line. However, there's another good option for black, and that is bishop d7, a very creative maneuver trying to get that bishop to the king side. And if a move like knight e5, we can simply play bishop e8, a whole idea being after a move like knight f3, 
we can just continue to develop our pieces with a move like knight d7. And now if a move like knight d3, we can play bishop h5. This is not the strongest piece in this position, but it is a ton better than that bishop on c8. And now if a move like queen c2, we can simply play rook a c8. Whole idea being if this game breaks open, it never hurts to have a rook pointed towards the opponent's king or queen. And now the very next move, I mean, let's say I play something like knight f e5, we can break this game open yet again, creating a ton of tension right in the center of the board. And we're just playing chess. Really the only difference here is that instead of having our bishop on b7 and our knight on a6, we have our bishop on h5 and our knight on d7. It really just depends on your preference. I think either of these is completely fine. In this position, black still has great chances to fight for the win. So guys, going back to this original position, we covered the move bishop b2, in which case we simply castled kingside and then continued with either b6 and bishop b7, or bishop d7, bishop e8, and bishop h5. Now what happens if the move a4 is played? Here white expanding on the queen side of the board and trying to play bishop a3, trading off with our bishop. Well, we can't stop bishop a3 from being played, but we can play the move a5 to not allow white to continue expanding on the queen side. And now once bishop a3 is played, we can simply capture that bishop, continue with a move like castling kingside. And here in this position, unlike our knight on a6, which covers a ton of key squares, this knight on a3 really isn't doing a ton. I mean, it is attacking b5, which by the way is defended, and it is defending c4, but we're not going to be taking this pawn on c4 anytime soon. So I really think that white should try to improve the positioning of this knight and play the maneuver of knight c2 followed by knight e1 with the whole idea of playing knight d3. This knight on d3 is much better off than it was on a3 looking to eye that e5 square. But here I still think that black is more than okay. In fact, following the move knight a6, black has drawn or won 90% of the games at the master and grandmaster level. I mean, this is just a very hard position to play with as the white pieces. I mean, even following a move like knight fe5, we can continue with either c5 yet again, creating that tension, creating that dynamic in the center of the board, or even play rook fd8, just preparing our back rank pieces for when things do break open. Yet again, we have a ton of the same ideas, and I think black is more than okay. If you guys would like to learn the theory behind the Dutch defense as a whole, aka sneak peeks into the classical Dutch and Leningrad Dutch, click the video to the left. If you'd like to learn how to play the Vienna game, click the video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel, and as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.